Italy. <coughs> um, it's now five o'clock. Good afternoon. Uh, before I start, are there any questions? Good questions. So I briefly go through slide number four and we saw uh, some of the examples of uh, chapter six. So for a, a solid, usually is three dimensional, but a lot of engineering examples uh, can be analyzed as two dimensional, a planar stress or a planar strain problems. For a planar stress or planar strain problem, at any point in a loaded component, we have at most a three independent stress values or stress components. Two normal and one shear. So this is a sorry about that. So this is a typical two dimensional strain matrix and this is a two dimensional stress matrix either for a plane stress problem or a plane strain problem. Obviously, to relate the strain components to stress components, we need two engineering constants for a metallic material. A metallic material is isotropic and homogeneous, so we need two engineering constants, E, Young's modulus, and Poisson ratio, to relate the strain components to stress components. G, the shear modulus exists, but it's not an independent material property. G is equal to E divided by two times one plus nu. So this is, these are the three stress-strain relations or constant equations relating a strain components to stress components. So you can see we can also write the stresses in terms of the strains. So on the left hand side, the strains are written in terms of stresses. On the right hand side, we've written stresses in terms of strain components. So this is a slide number four, and I have added an additional requirement to question number three. This requirement at the moment is not in the description of the example. I've just added it. So if you remember on Monday, I solved a different part of question three. We haven't finished it, but I, this is just additional requirements. So we've got, by inspection, we found this element within a loaded component, and this element is a subject to two normal stresses. Both of them are tension, 150 megapascals, and a shear stress of 75. Material is made of aluminum, Young's modulus is 70, Poisson ratio is 0.3, and we assume plane stress states. So the three cost of equations I showed you earlier do apply. So the problem is asking us to find the strain components at this position. So if you have three cost of equations, the first one, epsilon x is equal to one over e, sigma x minus nu sigma y. So this is 100 megapascals. 50 megapascals, Young's modulus is 70 gigapascals, so I've written everything in megapascals. So in that case, we end up with a very small value. We multiply by 10 to the power of 6, so that is the strain in the x direction. A strain in the y direction, epsilon y, is equal to 1 over e, sigma y minus nu sigma x. I just repeat the same procedure, and I find the strain in the y direction which is equal to 286 microstrain. So in your examination paper, you either get E and nu, or G and nu, or maybe nu and G. So the third one, because they're independent, two of them are independent, you can find the third one yourself. So in this case, you're after shear strain as well, so 2xy divided by g, and g is equal to e divided by 2 multiplied by 1 plus nu. It gives us g, which is almost like aluminium, 227 gigapascals here. And gamma xy is 2xy over g, so we end up with this value. It should be micro strain, I think I've written it here, capital M. Now I looked at, I browsed through some of this submissions you've made, I'm afraid uh, some of the groups had used for the 
fourth part of uh, the assignment sheets, they have used uh, the equation without uh, the, the equations without a Poisson ratio. Epsilon x have used the written epsilon x is equal to sigma x over e, and epsilon y is equal to sigma y over e. So the problem is two-dimensional. This is, these are the three constant equations for a typical two-dimensional Pinterest problem. So if I write for this problem, epsilon x equal to sigma x over e is not correct, or epsilon y equal to sigma y over e. So that's why I included this example for you. Any questions in relation to this example? I saw a similar example at the end of chapter one as well, which I briefly went through it on Monday. Any questions? No questions? So I started uh, solving different parts of question seven from chapter six on Monday. At the time, I didn't have the lecture slides with me, so I wrote the solution of a couple of cases for you by hand. So in question number seven, we have a different uh, components. They are either subject to one type of loading or subject to a combination of loads. We have a few inspection points selected for us on these components. So the problem is asking us to find the stress values at those points. Once we've got those stress values, then we need to find the strain components as well. So we assume for all these points, selected points, the penetrance state applies. So these are the three constant equations that we later use to find the strain components. So I repeat, we get the stress components in the analytical solution. And when, once we've got the stress components, assuming the penetrance case applies, we use these three equations to find the string components. So I cannot write epsilon x equal to sigma x over e unless sigma y equal to zero. So I started with question number seven, the first part of it. As I said, I wrote it by hand, so I didn't have the slides with me. So here I'm going to show you the solution, the typed version of it. So the, the first part, we have a component which is subject to axial loading. Either is a tension or it's compression. We assume the force is uniformly distributed. The cross-sectional area is equal to A. Therefore, any point along the length of this bar beam is subject to the same stress, which is equal to F divided by the area. So the two selected points here, one and two, or it could be any other point because force is uniformly distributed, they, ha they all have the same stress value. So for points one and two, stress is F over A. You have no force applied in the Y direction, so sigma Y is zero. And we have no shear force applied or the torque applied, so the shear stress is also equal to zero. So we have the three stress components. So we are assuming this is a pain stress problem. So we could have at most a three independent stress components, two normal and one shear. So if I want to draw them, so we only have sigma x applied to the two sides of elements, which is in a static equilibrium. Point one and two have the same situation. So we can see that they both have the same stress profile. The difference between case B and case A is that in this case the force is compressive, so whatever we have for the top we get for the bottom ones. Now I've got the stress values, now I use the three constant equations to find the strain values. So in this case sigma y is equal to zero, Two x y is equal to zero. Therefore, we can say epsilon x is equal to sigma x over e. So only when sigma y is equal to zero, I can write this equation here. So strain again, if you look at the second equation, sigma y is equal to zero. So we have minus two sigma x over e. 
and the shear strain is also equal to zero. Now the bottom two points have the same situation as the top ones, except the force applied is compressive. So we just have to add a negative sign next to whatever value you have on the top. So the compressive one minus F over A, sigma Y is zero, shear stress zero. So the signs are hidden inside these terms. Any question in relation to this one? So we move on to the next one. I solved this one as well, but I drew it by hand. At the time, I didn't have the slides with me. So this is a thin wood cylindrical pressure vessel. So we analyze some examples, six, seven examples in chapter two. And you also part of your first coursework was based on analysis of thin wood sections subject to internal pressure. So the two inspection points, one here, one there, but because pressure inside is uniformly distributed, any other points we select on the cylinder has the same situation as points one and two. So the thickness is T, the diameter, the mean diameter is D, the pressure is P. So the stress in the axial direction is PD over 40, in the circumferential direction is PD over 2T. Now I use X and Y coordinates for elements one and two, the local elements one and two, for local coordinates for elements one and two. Z is along the axis and theta is in the circumferential direction. So it means as I showed you on Monday, X is in the same direction as Z and Y for each element is in the same direction of a theta, a circumferential direction. Now once I've got these, I can just use the constant equations. So in chapter two, we said epsilon z is equal to one over e sigma z minus nu sigma theta. And we wrote sigma epsilon theta equal to one over e sigma theta minus nu sigma z. It's exactly the same. So this is both of them have the same values of the stresses acting on them. The sigma x, sigma y, there is no shear stress. So we only have two arrows here, two on each, one, one on each side. And point two has exactly the same situation as point one. So I've just write, I've written just for one of them. So it's for points one and two. Any questions? No questions. So we move on to the next example. I don't think I did this question. So we move on to chapter four, when a cylinder is subject to a torque. So the, here we see, are you okay? We have a solid circular cylinder subject to a torque. And on the right hand side, we've got a tube subject to a torque. So here we only got one point here. Actually, all the points on the outer layer of the solid cylinder are subject to the same shear stress. Now my question from you is that, what is a sigma x equal to for element one of this solid cylinder? What is sigma x equal to for element number one? What is sigma y equal to? No answers? Yes, please? Very good. So sigma x, both sigma x and sigma y are equal to zero because this is just subject to a torque. So both of them are zero. The shear stress is not zero. Shear stress is equal to TR over J, where J is the polar second moment of area. So here we've got, for element number one, sigma x is zero, sigma y is equal to zero. Question? I just wanted to ask if this is good notes for this whole thing. 
So in torsion of anything, pure torsion, no normal stresses are encountered, only shear stresses, right? That's correct. Very good. So if you remember in chapter uh, four, we never talked about normal stresses. We only calculated the shear stresses because the components were just subject to a torque. So here we've got sigma x equal to zero, sigma y equal to zero, and the only stress we have is a shear stress, which is 2xy equal to t r over j. t is the torque applied, r is the radius of the solid cylinder, and j is the polar second moment of area, which is pi d4 over 32. If I want to calculate uh, the the strain components, I just use the constant equations. Epsilon x must be equal to zero because both of them are zero. Epsilon y is equal to zero. And the shear strain gamma, gamma x y, is equal to the shear stress divided by the shear modulus. So here you can see we only have shear stresses around this element because shear stress is always complementary because of rotational equilibrium, we should have the same shear stresses all around. Any question in regard to point one? It could be any point. It doesn't make any difference because torque is uniformly distributed along the length. Now, we move on to the right-hand side. We've got a tube with the inner diameter, say, DI uh, di and the outer diameter DI. Sorry, I, just, I didn't say it correctly. The inner diameter of DI and outer diameter of DO. So the two inspection points, one is on the outer surface or outer layer of the tube and the other one is on the inner layer of the tube. So which one is subject to a lower stress value? The one inside or the one outside? If TR over J is the solution, which one of them has got a higher value of R in this equation? Outer layer or inner layer? That is correct. So the outer layer is subject to a higher stress, shear stress value, because it has a, a stress profile in linear. So the higher the value of R is, the higher the shear stress is and vice versa. So we start with point one. So point one, we ha it has no normal stress similar to case point one of the first one, the solid one. Sigma y is zero, and the shear stress is equal to TR over divided by J. And J is pi over 32, fourth power of outer diameter, minus fourth power of inner diameter. Now, we just use the same uh, method we did, using constant equations, we find the string components. And you can see we have no normal stresses active, it's similar to the first case. Now we move on to point two. Again, no normal stresses. The only shear stress acting is because of the torsion and I have to write here T times R I divided by J. J is the same for both, obviously. This is a property of this section. It does not change. It remains the same. So the difference between these two equations is just the vari vari variable R we have, the radius R we have. Outer, time, outer radius and inner radius. And again, we use the constant equations to find the stream values. Any questions? Okay, now we move on to chapter five, when the components are subject to bending. At the moment, the two components you see, the two beams you see, they are subject to pure bending moment. They're not subject to lateral shear force or distributed load. So we don't see any, we won't see any sign of flexural shear stress. 
when we apply a pure Wernier, the cross-section is just subject to normal stresses, which has linear variation. If you apply a lateral shear force, not only the cross-section is subject to normal stresses, it is also subject to shear stresses. But at the moment, it, these are pure bending moments. Now on the top one, is the pure is bending moment positive or is it negative? Positive or negative, the top one? Yes, you're answering all the questions, go on. Is it positive or negative? Positive. positive. So you've taken over from this gentleman here. So, <laughs> so the top one, it is a positive bending moment. So the top layer is going to be subject to compression. And the bottom layer is going to be subject to tension. So the two elements selected, one is on the top layer and one at the bottom. So point one. Do you agree that the stress applied at point one is minus m multiplied by y divided by i? y is the distance of this layer from the neutral axis. Say this is x axis here, capital X. I don't want you to mix it up with the x and y axis of these two. If this is, say this is, so if this is the x axis, capital C capital X. So this Y here is this distance from the neutral axis. And I is the second moment of so very of the cross section. So the top one is subject to compression, the bottom one is subject to tension. So sigma x equal to minus my over i. Now do we have any force applied in the y direction? No. Therefore sigma y equal to zero for each element and there is no shear stress applied or torque applied. So torque xy is also equal to zero. Now once we've got these I just use the constant equations. So point two, I've written point two first. So point two, we just have the same stress value except the sign is different, is tension. So on the top, point one, the two sides are subject to the same force but their compression. This is, these are the two which are equal to the first one, but they are tensile. Yes, please. Why is tau zero and not vi over ib? That's what I said, because at the moment, this is subject to pure bending moment. If it was subject to lateral shear force, yes, then we have, we have a sh so say if it was subject to a lateral shear force, here like this one, V equal to F. So pure bending moments do not produce shear stresses. Yes. Only when the bending moment is produced by a shear force, you get a shear stress. That's right. Yes. That's called flexural shear stress. Now we move on to the bottom one. The bottom one, the bending moment is negative. So the top layer is subject to tension and the bottom layer is subject to compression. So we have just the same stress value here in y over i, except the point one will be subject to tension and point two will be subject to compression. So point one now is subject to tension and point two is subject to compression. So I just add the negative sign here. So we've got four different stress values, I mean four stress matrices at the moment. So if I want to find the strain values or strain matrices, I just use the constant equations I showed you earlier. 
we have sigma y is equal to zero. So in the constant equation, I showed you sigma y doesn't exist. So we have epsilon x equal to sigma x over e, epsilon y minus nu sigma x over e, gamma xy equal to zero. Any question in regard to this example? Okay, let's move on to the next one. So, now this is a combined loading component, I mean, case. So could you please, I'll give you one minute to figure out what we are supposed to write for elements one and two. One minute, starting from now. Yes, please. Use the superposition principle. Yes. Right. Sit one minute, write it down. Okay. okay. So what I would like you to write, the value of sigma x for element number one of the top component, sigma x is equal to, does anyone know the answer? No. <laughs> no. You answered so many questions. We should answer. No, it's your turn. Okay. My turn? <laughs> okay, go on then. All right. Point one. Point one minus m y over i, uh, i being the capital i of second moment of area, plus f over cross section of a. Yes. And point two. Same thing, except the m y over i is positive. That's absolutely correct. So sigma x for point one. So f is tension. So this creates a comp tensile stress. This is on the compression side. So this is minus my over i plus f over a. So this is the stress applied in x direction to element number one. Sigma y is equal to zero. We have no force applied in the y direction. And shear stress is also equal to zero. Point two is very similar to point one, except both of them are positive. Now, if I was asked to design this component, I have to find out the maximum stress or principal stress or maximum shear stress or for Mrs. stress acting at point two, not point one. Because point two in comparison with point one is highly stressed. You can see these two points. So this is got the highest stress value applied to it. So I sh if I want to do some experiments, I attach a string gauges at point two, not point one. So this case, now could you do point one and point two for the second case, please? So the bending moment is still is positive, but the force applied is compression. Could you write it down, please, for the second one? So not you two, may I have somebody else answer for point, which of these two points is highly stressed? Point one or point two of the second component? So here, I've, if 
you just notice, I've drawn uh, for you with a green arrow. So it depends on the values of F and M, whether this is a positive or negative. So it could be positive, it could be negative. Depends on which one is bigger than the other one, which of these two terms is bigger. So that's why I've shown you with green arrows. So which of these two is highly loaded or highly stressed? Point 0.1 or point 0.2? A student who think it's point 0.1, could you please raise your hand? The students who think point 0.2 is highly loaded. Okay, so in this case, yes, point 0.1 is highly loaded. So at point 0.1, both of them are compressive stresses. The one coming from F and the one coming from M. And the other one is the, obviously, depends on which one is bigger than the other one. I think it should have been other way around. This point one should be compression. So this is point one is compression, point two is tension, that's correct. Point two is tension, oh no, that's, um, point two is tension. And point one is qu can't be right, so you're going to use them for revision, so make sure these are correct. So this is correct. So this point one, it should be compression. This should be compression as well. Yeah, that's right now. And the other one depends on which one is bigger than the other one. So this is going to be compression. This is so this is this is the correct one. Any questions? So as I said, once we've got the stress components, using the three constant equations I showed you at the very start, we can find the strain components. So this is just valid because the sigma y is equal to zero. If sigma y is not equal to zero, I'm not allowed to use this equation. So let's do this example. So we've got a thin mold cylinder, which is subject to, could be thick mold, it doesn't make any difference. So it's subject to, or solid cylinder, could, it's subject to a bending moment M and a torque T. And you're after these, uh, the stress values at these uh, three positions. Would you write them down, please? What do you think should, we should be writing here? The bending moment is positive, so point one is ob obviously subject to compression. Point three is obviously subject to tension, and point two is located on the neutral plane. So because of bending moments, it won't have any normal stress acting to it. So sigma x for point one is minus my over i, and y is half the radius of the cylinder. And I is the second moment of area of the cross section. There is no force applied in the y direction, but we've got a torque applied, so the shear stress is equal to TR divided by J. And J is the polar second moment of area of the cross section. So point one, are you happy with what I've drawn here? Any mistake? Point two, should I write the same thing for point two? 
No? What should I remove from point for point two? The two, very good. And point three, should I just change the directions of the two arrows? So we have no stress applied in the y direction here. So therefore, all three of them are equal to zero. Again, cost of equations, we assume plus stress state for all three and we solve it. So we move on to the next example. I believe I showed you the solution to this example uh, two weeks ago, but I briefly go through it again. So this is we had this is the case you had in the laboratory. You had a tube which was subject to a lateral shear force and a torque. So for the bending case, F was equal to the summation of the two forces you applied at the two ends of the rod, was equal to two little f. So here we've got the three points, the inspection points, one at the very top, one on the neutral plane, and one at the bottom. Could you write down what we are supposed to write for these three elements? I showed you the solution a while ago. Excuse me, could you sit down properly? If somebody sees from outside, it doesn't look very good. Um, Point one, because of the torque. What is the stress applied because of the torque? Is it shear or is it normal? Because of the torque applied. So the torque only applies shear stress. So we, the torque, say that the radius is R. For all three points, we have the shear stress of TR over J for all three points. Now point one is subject to bending and that because of the lateral shear force and that's the question you ask at the moment. You are applying a lateral shear force and the bending moment because of the lateral shear force at this location is equal to F times L. Now this bending moment, is it positive or negative because of F? It's a negative bending moment. So point one is subject to tension and point three is subject to compression. So the four point one is subject to a plus m y over i where m is equal to f l. There is no stress applied in the y direction sigma y equal to zero and the shear stress is equal to tr over j. So this is point one. You can see the two arrows are tension and we have shear stress all over. Point two is located on the neutral plane because of the bending moment. So sigma x is equal to zero. There is no stress applied in the y, so point two is just subject to shear, pure shear. Now here is, we've been told that we can ignore a deflectional shear stress. Otherwise, we have a VI over IB as well, but at the moment it's asking us to ignore the flexural shear stress. So the flexural shear stress will not be added to either of these two, it will be added to T R over J because it's a shear. Anyway, we, at the moment we ignore it. Point three will be similar to point one, except these two become compression, and we end up with this relation, these uh, three equations. So once we've got the cost of equations, we calculate strain values. OK. 
Okay. Now we move on to the next example, which is actually the example you have on the on slide number one. We have a thin walled uh, cylinder which is subject to internal pressure, it's subject to torsion, it's subject to axial force of F, and it's also subject to a positive bending moment. So all the elements, because of force F, are subject to the same stress of F divided by area, the cross-sectional area. If it's a thin walled section, then A is equal to pi D times T. So all the three elements are subject to the same stress, which is F over A. And because of pressure, obviously, we have a stress of axial stress of PD over 40, and we've got circumferential stress of a sigma PD over 2T. For the torsion, it's the same as the cases we covered so far, T R over J. Now I have drawn it in the other, I mean, in the anticlockwise direction. For two-dimensional problems, it doesn't make any difference. The bending moment, could you write down the answer for bending moment yourself, please? So what is sigma x coming from any moment for point one? Do you know the answer? You know the answer. Go on. Nobody is answering. <laughs> yes, please. M y over i. Okay. Negative or positive? You, if it's for the top. It's negative. Okay. It's to the bottom, it's positive. On, on the neutral plane? Assuming that the two lies in the neutral plane, plane zero. Okay. Because of the values of y. Yes, thank you very much. That's very good. So we've got my over i. At the moment, I've even written minus. I've just changed the direction of the sign. I mean, the arrows. It's exactly the same. It's compression, but it should write, I should write here minus my over i. But in some textbooks, they just show you with the direction of the arrow. So this is correct as well. So we have nothing coming from uh, the bending moment for point number two. And for point number three is tension. So are you happy with what I've written here? So sigma x, we are using superposition rule. I've applied each load individually. I've calculated the stress components for each load applied. Now I'm adding them up, I'm superimposing them. So stress at the moment in the x direction is equal to f over a, positive, pd over 40, positive, Minus m y over i and negative f over a, p d over 40, and m y over i. Stress in the y direction, we only have the effect of pressure. It only creates stress in the y direction for us. So p d over 2t. And the shear stress is coming from the torque. There is no flexural shear stress because this is pure bending moment. It's not a lateral shear force. So could you write on what the answer is here? For this case, please, for point two. I have to add all these values. What do you think I should write here? Just write it down, please.
So from the top one, we have f of a. Is it positive or negative? It's obviously positive. It's tension. This is tension. So f of a plus p d over 40. There's nothing from this torque applied, and there is nothing here. So sigma x is equal to f over a plus p d over 40. Sigma y is just p d over 2t. And the shear stress is the same as this case. So may I ask you to write it for the last point, point three, please? So point three, we have f over a positive, p d over 40 positive, and n y over i positive. So which of these uh, three points is highly stressed? Point one, a two, or three? If you know the answer, please raise your hand. You know the answer, anyone else? Do you know the answer? No, anybody else? Is point, I know you know the answer. So is point one highly stressed or if you, if you believe point one is highly stressed, could you raise your hand? If you think a point two is highly stressed, could you raise your hand? If you think point three is highly stressed. Excellent, well done. Well done, thank you. So if I'm supposed to design this point, Based on what you're going to learn on Monday, you need to find uh, the principal stresses, maximum shear stress, and also the formicity stress at this location, and then compare it with the yield stress of the material. If it's less than that, then you can say this component is safe, this structure is safe. So that is covered in the last slide of this chapter, failure criteria. So what we do first, based on the, we, the loads apply using the superposition rule. By inspection, we find the point or points which are highly loaded or highly stressed. Then for that just particular point or a few points within the structure, you, based on whatever you're going to learn on the last slide of this chapter, failure criteria, you can investigate whether this point or this component is going to fail or not. I don't think I've prepared anything else for you today. Right, so if we've got these uh, three stress components, we just use the three constant equations to find the strain values. This is the last slide. Any questions? No questions? Thank you very much, and I have a very nice weekend. Hopefully we finish up the six on Monday. Obviously, it depends on how you apply the tool. It is anchored by the process. So it doesn't affect both of them. Uh, yeah. There's no yeah. anything like positive direction, just rotate the face. I think now I'm going to explain the mode diagram. I explain it in the common day. Ask me the same question on Monday. Thank you. 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 Thank you.